It's crazy to think you can build something like this with just HTML, no CSS, no JavaScript at all. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now in this video, I'm gonna be showing you some of the more underrated and underused HTML elements and properties that I think should be used more and are incredibly useful, but people just don't understand them because there's so many HTML elements to know. And to get started, I'm gonna be showing three different elements, the field set, the legend, and the data list. And all three of these are what I've used to create this design over here on the right. And these are all based around forms. They're really useful for forms. So the first one I wanna talk about is the field set because it's by far the easiest. As you can see, I have this single field set element on the left side of my screen, and it wraps everything that we have inside of our form. And a field set essentially not only helps screen readers to be able to know exactly what different input elements go together, but also it allows you to create this nice little box around the actual elements. And we can put some text inside of that box to kind of label what this box of elements is supposed to be. So that's what this legend tag does. If you put a legend inside of a field set and give it some text, it's going to put that text inside of the border of this field set container. So not only does it help out screen readers by giving them more information saying that, okay, these two inputs here are for the favorites, favorite color and favorite fruit, but also it just looks visually pleasing to the user and you can modify the styles of the field set and the legend to your own you know, needs. So that way, if you put a little CSS on here, you can make it look even better. Now, the thing that probably blows your mind the most is these dropdowns here. I essentially have searchable dropdown list where I can say, okay, I want yellow and boom, I can select it from a dropdown list or I can type in a value that's not in there, for example, orange, and just leave it like that. This is something that you would think you'd have to use like a custom dropdown element or custom select inside of JavaScript for, but it's built into HTML. It's essentially autocomplete for a text field. And this way this works is with a data list. So you just take a normal input. In our case, we just have a normal text input, and then you give it a list property. And this list property, this list attribute is just the ID of the data list element. And the data list is really simple. It works very similar to a select. You just call it data list. And inside of it, you put a bunch of different options. And these options have no text. All they have is a value attribute. And this value attribute is the text that shows up in the box. So if I start typing here, for example, if I just click on it, you can see all the elements. And if I start typing like an R, you can see everything that has an R in there is shown. And I apologize that the text on this is a little small. Unfortunately, when I zoom in my browser, it doesn't actually make this text any bigger. It's just a little bit of a limitation here with this data list. So apologies for it being so small. But as you can see, I kind of have this nice drop down picker. I can pick something or, you know, like I said, I can just type in something that's not in that list. It really doesn't matter. It just gives you recommended options and is a great way to make an autocomplete list using just HTML. I have it for both of these, these fruit list and this list up here for colors are both using data list. And it's one of the coolest HTML properties that I literally don't see anywhere. Now, while we're on the topic of forms and colors, I wanna talk about a really interesting input type that you can use, which is a type of color. So let's just get rid of this data list here. And instead of having to type text, let's just change this to a type of color. What this allows us to do is to create a color picker built into HTML. So if I click on this, you can see I can choose any color that I want. You know, I can choose red, green, blue. I can also change it to HSL. You know, let's slide over to here to get this kind of like bright blue color right here. And then I can click off and you can see that this blue color has been selected. And I say, oh, you know what? Maybe I want green. So I do green. Boom. Built in color picker. Pretty useful. It'll vary depending on what browser you use, how it's implemented. But it's just a super simple way to create a color picker built into HTML. No CSS, no JavaScript, just type color. That's it. And there's tons of other types that you can use. You know, we're probably used to things like date, but you can also use time, for example. And now I can input time. So there's a ton of these really cool different input types that allow you to not have to write any JavaScript or CSS when normally you would have done that before. Now, the final form kind of base thing that I want to talk about is the progress element. So let's say that we had, you know, like a file upload bar that we wanted to render. Well, normally you'd write out some custom HTML and CSS to do that, but there's a progress element built into HTML. So let's just write out this progress element just like that. As you can see, we have a progress element here. And if we want, we can specify that we have a value on this. Let's just say we have a value of 50 and we specify a max, which in our case is just gonna be 100. So now you can see that this progress bar is 50% full. We can also put some text inside of here, for example, 50%. And this text is gonna be really useful for people on screen readers, for example, to be able to know where the progress is. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is actually not an HTML element, 
but it's specifically part of the meta element tag inside of HTML. So you know in the head you can put meta tags and these meta tags allow you to define a bunch of data about your website. And one of the things that they allow you to do is to determine how your website is going to be embedded into other websites when shared in places like Discord, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And this is something that YouTube does that you can see in Twitter, for example, that it has the thumbnail for the image, the ability to play the video, it has the title, and all of this other cool information specifically on Twitter. And if we want to figure out how this actually happens, we can just click on one of these links and actually go to YouTube. We'll just pause the video here. We really don't want to watch a Webflow ad, do we? And if we just inspect the page, we can go into the source and we can go up into the head. So we'll just go all the way up here into the head element because this is where all the meta tags are defined. All we need to do here is if we want to find these meta tags that have that, we just search for meta and hopefully that'll find us all of the meta tags. And we just want to wait until we find one that has the property that specifies OG something. Here we go. We just found one. So as you can see here, we have a bunch of different meta properties. Let me just zoom this in a little bit to make it easier to see. So we have a bunch of meta tags here and these meta tags have different properties. So for example, property OG site name, OG URL, OG title, OG image, and so on. There's a ton of them specified for YouTube. And what these essentially stand for is open graph and then site name, open graph URL. And open graph is just a protocol that Facebook actually created for how that you can share things on Facebook and they parse this and they say, okay, the title is, are you programming too much? The image is this image, which is the thumbnail for my video. And if we keep going, we'll probably sign something OG video URL. Oh, here's the URL to actually play the video. So it has a bunch of information related to the actual content of the website. So that way, when you share it, it'll have the title displayed properly. It'll have the description displayed properly. It'll maybe have a cover image displayed. That's what all of this does. Really the most important ones that you're looking for, you want to care about the OG URL, the title is super important, image is really important, description is important, and site name is important. These are the most important things when it comes to open graph information. But also you'll notice there's a few other tags, and if we keep going a little further down, you'll notice there's actually Twitter-specific tags. Twitter is kind of interesting because they have their own tags that you can create, and these tags right here are just Twitter-specific. They start with Twitter and then colon, but they also work with the open graph tags as well, so you can customize it even further with Twitter if you want. So depending on what site you're sharing to and where the links are actually shared, they're going to parse this OG data for you and actually display a proper card or whatever it is to really specify exactly what's on your site so they can show like a preview of the content. That's what this does. And whenever you see that pop up in places like Discord or Twitter or Facebook, almost always they're going to be using this open graph implementation. So if you can just put these few meta tags in the header of your site, it's going to make your site so much more shareable and clickable because people are going to see exactly what's in your article right away with those nice little card pop-ups that show up. Now this next HTML element is amazing because it's something I used to use CSS for all the time. And then once I realized it was built into HTML, it just blew my mind and it was awesome. So right now we have things like H2O, O2, X squared times Y to the fourth. Things where the number should be really small and either at the bottom, in the case of H2, the 2 should be small and next to the bottom of the H, same with O2, or things where the number should be small and at the top, like an exponent, X squared, Y to the fourth. So to do that, normally you'd write some CSS, make it smaller, put it in the right position, or you can use the sub and sup elements. Sub essentially means that it's a small number that goes on the bottom. So we can just say sub here and wrap the two in that sub element. And now if we save, you can see this two has shrunk down and gone below the line. It's now next to the H at the bottom. Same thing here for O2, we can do a sub. And if we save, you notice that the two goes down to the bottom. Now we can do the exact opposite, which is the sub element. And the sub element is just like sub, but it makes the element go up to the top. So as you can see here, we have X squared. Do the same thing here for Y. And if we just save this real quick, you can see that we now have y to the fourth. So this sub and sup elements, they're super small, super niche, but they're incredibly useful and save you from writing so much CSS. Also, it's really important because screen readers now know that this is like a sub number and a sup number. So they know that, oh, maybe this is an exponent or maybe this is just denoting something as opposed to being part of the actual sentence, which can be really useful. Now, the next property I wanna talk about is one that is incredibly useful when it comes to responsive design, as well as serving the smallest image possible to your user. So generally, when you create an image, you just load in one image. And it can be difficult because maybe the image is gonna to be too large or it's gonna to be too small for the screen you're on because an image on mobile doesn't need to be very big, but an image on a massive desktop needs to be pretty big. This is where the picture element comes in. All you do is take a normal image, so I just have a normal image, as a source of logo.png and I just put a style on it to make it 700 pixels wide so that you can see the image pretty clearly. You just wrap this in a picture image 
And then before your image tag, this image tag should be the very last thing in your picture, you just put some source tags. And these source tags contain what's called a source set. And the source set is a path to another image. And then you can do something else and add a media query onto it, where you essentially say, I only want this image to appear if the min width is 900 pixels or greater. So this is really useful if you have, for example, a really large image and then a smaller version that's more optimized for mobile. So this logo.png would be the small size, while this logo gray.png is the larger, more desktop focused image. That way, when I'm on a mobile device, I only ever load this really small image. But if I'm on a desktop and I have the extra bandwidth, I'm gonna load this larger image instead. So if I shrink down my screen, for example, you'll notice immediately when I hit that 900 pixel breakpoint, it switches over to the other logo, this one right here, as opposed to the gray one. But also, if I was just gonna refresh my page here, let's say I'm loading it on my phone, it's only gonna load this logo.png and it's not gonna load this gray one at all which is just going to save me memory because this logo.png is most likely going to be smaller since it's optimized for mobile. On top of that, what you can do is you can specify different formats. So there's a format called WebP, which is great because it's smaller than a normal PNG, but not all browsers support WebP. So if you have a browser that supports WebP, you can just put this source set in here for logo.webp, and then you can have the fallback be this PNG image right here. So all you have to do is specify the type of the image, which in our case is webp, and then the location of it, which is logo.webp. And now we're loading the webp version of this image because this browser supports webp. It's pretty much impossible to tell that it's loading the webp version because they're both the exact same colored image. But if I put this gray image back in here, and I comment this out, you'll notice that when we're on a large screen size, that the image is gray. And now when I comment this in, the image is now blue. And that's because this logo that's WebP is the first source listed. And it's the first one that's true because this browser supports image slash WebP. So it's loading this image right here and ignoring everything else afterwards. So it loads it from top to the bottom. Also, another thing you can do with your source set is if you don't want to specify these media queries manually, what you can do instead is put a space after your name of your image. And then you can specify one of two things. You can specify the actual width of the image so you could say this image is 100 pixels wide, you'd say 100W. Then if you wanted, if you had another image, you just put a comma in here, you could say like logo small.png, and let's say this one's only 50 pixels wide, so you put 50W. And you could do a couple sources like that and you can separate them all by commas. And the browser is just gonna be smart enough to determine, okay, how big is this image on the screen? And it'll choose the one that is the smallest that will fit in that space and look good. So it'll do all of that media query stuff for you. Also, you can specify the density of your image for like pixel density and resolution. You could say like 2x here for a double density image or 1x, for example, or you could have 4x, and that'll help the pixel density of your device will determine which image to choose. Generally, though, I find this picture element is best for, you know, having fallbacks for new image types. So you can fall back to this normal PNG as opposed to using the WebP if your browser doesn't support WebP. Or if we just go back a little ways where we have the media query, I find those to be some of the best ways to use this picture element because it just allows you to serve the smallest image possible to your user while giving them the best visual clarity. Now the final HTML element that I want to talk about is by far my favorite out of everything we've talked about. I even have an entire blog article on the topic already, I'll link in the description for you, but this is the template tag. And the template tag is amazing because you can put anything you want in here. You can just have simple text, you'd have some crazy HTML, you know, I could put this inside of, you know, an H four or five, for example, let's do an H5. Inside that H5, we're just gonna have that text, this is a template. And we could have more than just, you know, this little bit of text, we could have even more text because inside this H5, we could have a small that says I, for example. So this is going to be my HTML. Let's just space this out so it looks a little bit better. This is my template and you'll notice, it doesn't matter what I do, nothing shows up on the screen. That's because by default, templates don't actually show up on the screen, but, the nice thing about templates is you can access them in JavaScript. So I got my template element here and you access the content property of the template and you call clone node and you pass true. That essentially says that you want to get all of the elements inside the template. If you didn't pass true, it would just return the H5. We want the small as well. So that's why we pass true. And then we have all of the elements inside this template. We can add it to the page. We can modify it by adding content to it and so on. So now if I save, you notice that this is being printed out to the screen just like this. And if I didn't pass true here to clone node, you're going to notice it doesn't actually get anything. And that's why we pass true here, just to make sure that we get all of the content inside of that template. This is a super great way to be able to dynamically add content to a page using JavaScript 
where it's going to follow the same pattern over and over again, but all you need to do is change small things. Like for example, we could change the text inside this small section by just selecting that. So we could say like content dot query selector small. And then we could say like inner text equals this. And now when we save, you can see we've printed out that text instead. So we're able to really easily change just a small subset of HTML but we can write that HTML in HTML as opposed to having to write it out in JavaScript, which is much more difficult to do. And those are the most underrated HTML elements. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other videos linked over here. I have a CSS version of this exact video and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day.